Alright, I'm the pop culture alcoholic and I am suffering from a media hangover. You know, I was just musing the other day on what it is that makes movie franchises attractive enough to a large group of people that be they become kind of like a religion in their own right. And I think one of the most defining qualities is that they tend to create their own fictional universe. I mean, there's The Lord of the Rings, Star Wars, Star Trek, Doctor Who, and dozens of other series that pride themselves on being crammed with information that fans adore to know and outsiders will never truly appreciate. Right, me fellow Whovians? <sighs> it tastes like betrayal. But then, even when you're someone like me, who's interested in, say, the Lord of the Rings mythology doesn't stretch much further than the films, the mythos is still truly fascinating. I mean, trust me, never go on to the Lord of the Rings and Wikipedia when drunk. You'll end up spending hours reading about the history of the Maya. And I suppose it's only natural that after people have spent so much time looking into the backstories of great warriors and mythical creatures and spectacular space battles, that we would be just ready to put the same amount of effort into looking into the background of a disgustingly middle-class white kid. Welcome to the Harry Potter film franchise. Now I assume you know the story of Harry Potter, but in case you don't, let me break it down for you. <sighs> A kid called Harry Potter, who was raised by his cruel aunt and uncle, goes to a school for magic people where it turns out he has an arch nemesis named Voldemort who killed his parents and wants to rule the wizarding world. And according to a prophecy, because of course there's a fucking prophecy, with the help of his far more skilled friends, Harry must defeat the dark wizard and save the wizarding world forever. Now I'm not just going to spend my review looking at the bigger issues in the Harry Potter film franchise, like maybe it might have been an idea to try a different antagonist more than once in seven stories. I'm also going to talk about the little things, those small little moments that really bug the hell out of me from the Harry Potter film franchise. And, to add a twist to things, we're going to start with number nine. So, I hope you have a firm grasp on your wand or one hand on your pygmy puff. This is my top ten worst moments in the Harry Potter film franchise. <laughs> Number 9. The racist shrunken head from Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. Okay, so I'm starting off easy here. If there's one Potter movie everyone can agree they enjoyed, it's the Prisoner of Azkaban, and I agree that I enjoyed it. Though, looking back, I can't really remember why exactly. I mean, do you remember this scene? lovely goddamn image that was for your kids. A lot of hate went into making that scene, didn't it? On top of that, they ripped off the story device from Back to the Future Part 2. Still, when people talk about Prisoner of Azkaban, nobody ever seems to mention this. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, three and a half, two, one and three quarters. Yes! This is the sort of thing the internet usually loves to tear apart. And it's really hard to understand the purpose of this thing in this story. I mean, there's nothing like it in any of the other movies. Well, apart from maybe the anti-Semitic goblins. And there's the fact that the only Asian character in the entire series is called Cho Chang, of all things. And I suppose just the total and utter whiteness of the lead cast, but this still stands out like a sore thumb. And you may be thinking it's odd that I'm focusing so much on something that only appeared in one scene early on, but it's obvious the creators paid just as much attention to it. I mean, they had the shrunken head doing the cast interviews on the DVD extras. You know what they say, once you've gone out with a shrunken head, you never go back. <laughs> I mean, it's just obvious that they wanted this racist archetype to be the comedy highlight of the entire movie. Plus, just look at the thing. Was it not enough for them to run the entire film through a tank of murky, stagnant water before they released it? They also felt the need to populate it with horrifying visuals? It's going to be a bomb. Peace Going to kill me, Harry. Oh, Dad. Well, that answers my question. Number eight, Dobby. Now, I'm not the first to say it, but it is unfortunately true. Dobby is the Jar Jar Binks of the Harry Potter film franchise. 
He is cheap CGI comic relief, but that doesn't mean I don't like him. When he first appeared in the Chamber of Secrets, he was a pretty annoying yet charmingly well-intentioned little thing. He had this fantastic, filthy, aged look to him, which kind of made him look wise and knowledgeable, yet he also had those huge, expressive eyes, making you want to sympathise with him. I mean, just look at that shit-eating grin, and that teleport effect is awesome. And oh shit, look, it's Len! You address me by my proper title, you little bollocks! I couldn't wait for his return in the fourth movie, as the books foretold, but then we didn't see him until he was brought back to die in the penultimate film. This worked emotionally in the books because Dobby was an established, long-running character who had featured in every single story apart from The Philosopher's Stone and The Prisoner of Azkaban. His death was completely unexpected. In the movies, however, he is a long-forgotten, practically estranged CG Muppet of a character. It was also animated differently, trying to make him seem less grimy and edgy and more clean and puppy doggish. You know, more marketable. Don't be afraid. He also speaks in first person now. Well, sometimes. Dobby will always be there for Harry Potter. Of course, uh, I'm an elf. Dobby only meant to maim or seriously injure. I like her very much. Ah, good continuity is for losers. Let's face it, not a well-handled character, but you can shed your tears over the ridiculous CGI spud with ears if you like. Just make sure they're CGI tears. That way no one will ever believe in or care about them. <laughs> Number seven. The Crowbar in Characters. It takes a colourful cast to make a film series like this, and since the series is based on a series of books, it can be considered important for a writer, especially when already terrified that fans won't enjoy your work because it's, say, not very well written, not to give fans any other excuse not to like the work by leaving out characters from the book. Still, it shouldn't be a problem as long as the writers can still keep their audience entertained whilst having lots of time to flesh out these memorable and beloved characters. You know, like... This guy, and... What's his face? And everyone's absolute favourite... I want to say Lawrence? Then again, given JK's reputation, it's probably just some ridiculous made-up name, like... Fiberglass or something. Number 6. Cho Chang's Rejection. Okay, this one's more of a glaring plot hole that bothers me that no one ever seems to mention. In the Order of the Phoenix, Harry and his friends gather together as an army of students with the collective desire to preserve the proper education of witches and wizards at Hogwarts. Because they know that there are dark times ahead, what with the 21st century on the way, and as Captain Jack Harkness will tell you... You've gotta be ready. Unfortunately though, Cho Chang, the girl using Harry as Mr. Rebound since her Twilight boyfriend died, is poisoned with Veritas Serum, a truth potion, forcing her to relinquish the truth to the teachers. In response to this, she is rejected by the group, which the movie presents as having been done quite rightfully, as if she deserves it. Hello, writers! You do realise that you made her irresponsible for her actions, right? She was goddamn poisoned and had no choice! But no, she gets ostracised. The movie actually thinks this is how you should treat someone who was forced into a situation by circumstances they couldn't possibly hope to control. It's not a huge thing really, but then again, I probably wouldn't be quite so annoyed about this plotline if it didn't bring us the magical gift of this shot. Oh my god movie, you deserve to burn in hell for those four seconds alone! David Bradley, I have never been simultaneously more sorry for and more angry at someone for participating in anything ever. God, no! And by the way, I hate to bring it up again, but does the fact that the only character of Asian descent in the entire series' name is Cho Chang not bother anyone else? I mean, really, JK? I mean, I know it's a real name, but does that not send on any connotation bells ringing in your head? You know, no reminders of pejorative terms used to mock the Chinese language that spring to mind? No? Really? Well, I guess we'll just move on then. Number five. Ron and Hermione's romance. Actually, let's be honest, all the romances. Now, I'm not going to sit here and deny that teenagers are horny little buggers. At that age, one does tend to want to do everything one sees. And in any realistic teenage relationship, it's only understandable that Ron and Hermione would eventually hook up. 
as likely would Harry and Hermione. Hell, if the internet has taught us anything about Harry Potter, it's that the idea of Harry and Ron boning does tend to play on many fans' minds. But these are not the kind of encounters that lead to long-term relationships. I mean, understandably, Ron and Hermione are both a little bit desperate, neither of them having had a single boyfriend or girlfriend going through puberty, apart from Hermione having that awful Hungarian Channing Tatum lookalike when she was 14 years old, who we are regrettably informed is... More of a physical being. That is disgusting! But all the same, she and Ron clearly don't have that good of a connection, and we're seemingly meant to act like they're destined to be together. I mean, I can barely think of a single exchange between the two that wasn't just filled with hate. I mean, remember all those sexually charged scenes like... Do you ever stop eating? Oh, I'm hungry. Hey guys, are you ready to get in on that suicide pact with me yet? The final kiss as well just comes completely out of nowhere. Oh, being covered with water just makes me so randomly randy. Randomly randy? You know, I think I just came up with a new name for my band. Anyway, my point is, some actual cue beyond the couple looking awkward around each other sometimes would have been nice. But then, when I thought about it, a lot of the romances in these films seem to be rushed. I mean, there's Lupin and Tonks. That came completely out of nowhere. I should remember, Fleur. Bill takes his stakes on the raw side now. <laughs> My husband, the Joker. By the way, wait till you hear the news. Then there's whatever these two are called. And then, of course, there's Neville and Luna. You haven't seen Luna, have you? Luna? I'm not for her. I think it's about time I told her since we'll probably both be dead by dawn. Sure, who didn't know all about that? Even Harry and Ginny only seem to get together because they constantly end up in somewhat suggestive situations. There's no real chemistry between them whatsoever, just hormonally jacked up teenagers. And by the way, how much more awkward could they possibly have made this scene? Has Ron gone to bed? Um, not yet, no. Shoelace. There is no getting around the fact that the director is trying to make me think about the fact that her head is near his phallus right now. And David Yates, Daniel Radcliffe wanting a 15 year old girl to kiss his penis is something I never, ever want to think about. Sorry, David Yates, but when it comes to the lovey-dovey stuff, you're just not the best out there. They're kissing again. Do we have to hear the kissing part? Number four. Neville's character arc. So we all know who Neville Longbottom is, right? The dorky doughy kid that puberty turned into a chiselled, stylish, fair-skinned, handsome... well, groomed... Um, uh, <coughs> a young actor who uh, nobody remembers the name of, but when he first appeared in the franchise he was still a dorky little kid and rather a bland comic fool. Now I'm not saying it would have been good if he'd stayed that way, I just think his transition was pretty poorly handled. Hell, in the two penultimate movies he barely makes a single appearance. He has two scenes in the seventh film and two lines in the sixth. And then next thing we know he's practically HP's replacement, making big dramatic speeches in front of Voldemort. They didn't die in vain, but you will, because you're wrong. <laughs> Harry's heart did beat for us, for all of us. It's not over. In the name of all things pointy-eared and buck-toothed, let us stand up and cry, we are herbologists. <laughs> Find myself in times of trouble. Mother Mary comes to me. Speak Let's just say his character development could have been handled a little smoother. And need I even bring back up? You ever see Luna, have you? Luna? I'm not for her. Ah, Neville, we knew all along. With all the time we've spent together, we practically consider you family. Plus, we of course have moments like this. Yeah! You and who's army? 
Ha ha, what a laugh this is considering you people tortured my parents to insanity. <sighs> Number three. Not recasting the kids after the first couple of movies. Okay, let's get down to brass tacks here. Daniel Radcliffe isn't the best actor. I'm sorry internet, don't stab me. It's just kind of the truth. I've not seen every movie he's ever appeared in, but from what I've seen, I'm pretty happy to stick to that belief. So all that I am saying, granted with the benefit of hindsight, is that we could have maybe theoretically considered replacing him with a better actor. Wouldn't that have been, you know, good? I don't want to harangue child actors here, but surely one might be able to spot the warning signs early on. I mean, with such stellar acting as... 50 points will be taken. 50? Each. And to ensure... This moving on to lies delivered with such conviction as... He was their friend. And he betrayed them. He was their friend! By God, I love to mock that line. Like, on a daily basis. And we don't seem to see much improvement by the end. I mean, look at this scene from the last movie when Harry summons up the ghost of his lost loved ones. Hey son, uh, your dad over here in the back. You know, the one you've never met in your life and maybe have only had the chance to say one thing to since you were a one-year-old? Do you think you could just look at me? Acknowledge my presence? Do you even know I'm here? And you're probably all thinking, sure, it's easy to knock Radcliffe's performance, but then who would you seriously suggest to take his role in his place? Two words. Ewan Rian. Just imagine it. Be still my heart. Number two. Voldemort. What a waste of a potentially terrifying antagonist. This almost faceless villain was built up for four movies, and this is the performance we decided to go with in the end? Now let me first say that I love Ray Fiennes. He is a great actor and he has performed in some of my favourite roles. But this... This is too much. Now getting past the noselessness, Though having said that, do you know when Voldemort did appear in the early movies and he was actually intimidating? One thing I always took notice of was that he had a nose. When did it seem like a good idea to take it away? It just turns him into some pantomime monster villain and has me wondering what it looks like when he gets a cold. But getting past that, when Fiennes first took on the role, he was pretty good. Not scary, but relatively dignified and memorable. Rather over the top, but stylishly maniacal. Then four movies go by, and we have... How on any plane of existence was anyone meant to take this seriously? Oh no, the fabric will envelop me and turn me into a member of the Black Parade! Did they honestly think the idea of having to smell Voldemort's cloak sweat would strike fear into the hearts of the audience? Fighting with fashion may sound good if you're writing for an enchantress version of Cruella de Vil. But for the Dark Lord, the most powerful and evil wizard alive, I've got to say, it's not that great a threat. And Fine's actual performance? Well, I mean, it's no this. <laughs> but it is getting there. And plus, it all builds up to one of the most anticlimactic death scenes in all of cinema. I mean, right after we have this confusing load. Oh, come on, Tom. Let's finish this the way we started. Together. I don't know what happened there, but let us never speak of it again. We then get this. Okay, I don't know what's happening. Does, does this mean... Oh. Uh, okay. So, so he's dead now, then. Right? 
A lengthy performance that begins well, leads us to become bored as hell, and finally ends in utter bewilderment. A pretty fine metaphor for the entire Harry Potter film franchise. And now for the number one aspect of the Harry Potter film series that bugs me most. This last heinous crime consists of one particular line taken from The Goblet of Fire, the fourth Harry Potter movie. Picture the scene. Tis a cold, dark night at Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry, and tensions are running high after Harry Potter's name was plucked from the Goblet of Fire, a magical device that decides who is to participate in the Triwizard Tournament, despite the fact he somehow came forth in a selection of three champions. Thus he shall be forced to compete in the potentially deadly games, though he is far too young to enter and not nearly qualified enough. Ron that night reveals to Harry that he is entirely without a sense of perspective, and is in fact feeling betrayed by Harry failing to aid him in an attempt to enter the suicide games, and is envious of all the attention Harry is going to receive, that being an entirely new thing and all. After some heated arguing, during which Harry undoubtedly asks Ron if he read the script before saying yes to this one, and most likely magicked up a dictionary in order to show Ron the definition of the word sidekick, Ron lands a final verbal blow upon Harry unlike any previously encountered in the history of rapier wit. Are you ready to hear it? I know I'm not. I don't know what happened tonight and I don't know why. It just did. Okay? Piss off. You hurt me. I mean, my God. Never before has any man combined such elegance of speech with such brutal profanity. Never before have my ears been forced to bear witness to such crushing, irrefutably dignified prose. It is an insult entirely appropriate in its context that shatters the emotional boundaries of both adults and children alike, revealing a layer of denigration that I had hitherto thought possible. One need not even see Harry's face to understand the emotional anguish this statement has caused him, a pain unlike any he will have experienced since the near-fatal stab of the basilisk fang he received two years previously. And even though we need not see his face, they go ahead and show it anyway! And even through the heartbreak he is exhibiting with his tortured countenance, one can clearly make out a spark of fear penetrating the jaded heart of our hero at the sudden realisation of the verbal power that his friend has been toting, holding back concealed beneath his own invisibility cloak, a figurative invisibility cloak of a ridiculous mugging for all these years that they have been companions. Truly, Harry has met his new match in this world. Voldemort will simply have to join the queue. I'm sorry, I need a moment to digest the line. I mean, obviously, the filmmakers left a, a long pause after the line, you know, a totally deserved one to, to let the impact hit home with the audience, but it wasn't long enough. It just wasn't long enough. And it is this kind of writing that preserves these films as timeless classics, sensational for people of all ages, with all the quiet majesty of a beautiful oil painting.
Another example of the kind of distinguishing line that exalts the series so is delivered by our fair Ronald at the age of 18, having had years to hone his skills as a wordsmith, when confronted by a life or death situation, having just won the kiss of his fair maid Hermione for the first time, when he delivers this line. Ah, that's my girlfriend, you nutty! It's just so mature and adult of him to say it, and not remotely like something written by a 12 year old with no context of what is appropriate behaviour for someone of that age range, or how to retain status in a franchise or a character. This is a line clearly the writers read back to themselves over and over, and never once did a crack of doubt appear in their minds. They knew that we could only be blown away by the inherent dignity that such a line carries. I mean, I can only say that it is the most- Okay, I can't keep this up. What the hell was wrong with the writers of these movies? How did they think for a second that they could put this kind of shit in a film and still retain any shred of composure? I mean, this dialogue! Seriously? Hagrid's looking for you. Well, you can tell Ronald- I'm not an owl! How did any of this shit make the final cut? I mean, what a great scene that was. That really captured the conflict to the heart of the characters. Clearly, Hermione's greatest hurdle to overcome in the Goblet of Fire was people comparing her to aviary creatures. I'm not an owl! You tell him, sister. I mean, people adore this movie franchise. How? Admittedly, the film franchise does remain relatively watchable in some parts, but this is just beyond the pale of utterly juvenile tripe. I enjoy the first three Harry Potter movies relatively well, but from then on I find it has few good qualities, and what there is is outweighed easily by this pile of asinine story faults, resulting in a series I can probably sum up as tedious with a few flashes of utter revulsion. Kinda like watching Kick-Ass 2, except it's 20 hours long. Well, after all that, I think we all know the best way to deal with these DVDs, while simultaneously paying homage to the greatest performance in this film series. Let's do it now. Gone. All of the movies gone. I'm the pop culture alcoholic, and there's no post on Sundays. No! Wait, 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 hang on a sec, I haven't done the tenth point yet. Well, the reason I didn't do the tenth point in the main body of the review is because it's a bit of a more serious subject matter and I didn't really want to talk and the main body of the review on a sombre note. So, here we go. Number ten. The money grabbing. I put this as number ten because it's not necessarily an issue that permeates throughout the Harry Potter film franchise. And when it came to the last Harry Potter book, I could understand the idea of splitting it into two films. It was rich with plot, some might say far more politically driven than its predecessors. However, the films did not choose to use the time they were given to explore those more interesting and complicated aspects of the book series. Instead, the first film was used to show our heroes sitting around in dark forests for almost the entire duration, feeling terror at the prospect of the expectations and faith the public had placed in them, whereas the second movie was spent on stuff like this. Ah, that's my girlfriend, you nutty! Still, those feelings that our heroes experienced in that wood in the film would have not actually been that far off from the feelings of the writers and director of the final film, knowing that they were responsible for ending a film series that promised to be one of the most successful of the 21st century. They not only had to live up to past efforts, but also had to produce a film that would continue to bring in sales and fan interest for future years to come. Something that would distinguish itself as a landmark in cinematic history that parents would buy for their children to watch, or that this generation or future generations themselves would consistently desire to view again and again over the course of their lives. And I'm going to come right out now and say that they failed. Not necessarily for lack of trying, mind you, but they clearly failed to render a project that the majority of people are going to keep in their hearts forever. And their awareness of this is clearly manifested in the soulless cash grab that we all know is to come.
And we all know why they're doing it, because money is an addiction. When regarding the first Harry Potter sequel, which I do love to this day, I've never looked back upon it and seen through to some ulterior financial motive. And I don't think that this just extends from some childish naivety at the time of its production. It's simply knowing and feeling from observation that the people who worked on this piece, wrote and directed it, were invested in the progression of a story, of a project. But things have changed now. The book may have been worth splitting into two movies given the story. Unlike other franchises, I won't mention to avoid opening up that can of worms. But it was part of a movement in cinema designed by the moneyed who only desired to become yet further moneyed. And it's gone to the point in movie history where no movie can just be left untouched in its completion. I mean, Terminator 5 is just a small aspect of this movement. I still can't believe the words Terminator 5 are coming out of my mouth. The Terminator franchise was settled at 2, successful and critically well received. But we can't let go. The Harry Potter franchise was finished at 8 movies, but we can't just let go. The upcoming JK movies, like many a modern sequel, are just sad ploys relying entirely on memories of fans' prior film experiences to validate their existence, to earn tickets. A prequel. There's a word with plenty of fine connotations right now. Somebody has to tell successful writers to stop George Lucasing already. Hell, you could say that I'm overreaching. Perhaps the upcoming films will be magnum opuses, but Given the track record of such similar movies, and the fact that this trilogy, the new trilogy of films, is based upon a series of books with literally zero story to speak of, call me Mr. Cynical, but I rather doubt it. I'm the pop culture alcoholic, and I'm trying to make funny reviews in a dark time of filmmaking.